can make a comment, but I won't. <laughs> sure, sure. Hey, moving could, on. Could you ask if that uh, military guy's here so we make sure he... Yeah, uh, we had a comment. Uh, sir, is that is that you? You're going to make a, a comment today? Okay, so we'll... Uh, no. Okay, fine. Okay, this is item 6A. This is a continued public hearing. Tentative track map number TM812 slash PSR. This is an R7 Enterprises, David and Roberts of Roberts Engineering. Mitigated negative declaration and mitigated monitoring plan with exceptions to divide 225 acres into 162 single family residential lots in a PDFM zone. The site is located on the west side of Millwood Road uh, between Avenues uh, 352 and Avenue 360, approximately one mile northwest of Woodlake. This is continued from February 26, 2014, and Chuck is our contact. Chuck, go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Chuck Brzebilski, uh, Planning uh, Division. I will present a brisk, brisk overview of the project, and then I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Hector Guerrera of the Environmental Planning Division and Aaron Bach, uh, the Chief Planner of the uh, Planning Division also. Uh, the brief project is uh, the subdivision of 225 acres into 162 uh, residential lots in 10 phases. The CEQA document prepared for this particular project was a mitigated negative declaration as you mentioned, this is a continued public hearing from uh, February 26th, and the location is Colvin Mountain, which is uh, just west of Woodlake. Shows the vicinity of the particular project. Uh, Woodlake, just to the southeast. Uh, the site is right here, and Visalia to the southwest. It shows the zoning of the particular project. This was zoned in 1981 as PDFM uh, and on the site of Colvin Mountain itself and the surrounding area is actually zone AE20. This shows the aerial photo of the site of Colvin Mountain to the west, the city of Woodlake to the southeast, and then the subject site along Cottonwood Creek. shows the subdivision itself of 162 lots. It shows the phasing of the particular project. It also shows the two well lots on the northeast of the project site right here and right here. It has a open space corridor along this area right here. Uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, Hector Guerrera uh, for his pre per, uh, part of the presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, members of the public, thank you for attending. I am uh, Hector Guerra. I am the Chief Environmental Planner of the Tulare County Resource Management Agency Planning uh, <coughs> Branch. Uh, what I want to do today is provide an introduction, and Mr. Bach will provide a, a more thorough discussion on our response to comments regarding environmental issues that were raised uh, at the last Planning Commission in addition to comments that we received. And again, public, thank you so much for providing those. It makes me do my job more thoroughly so we can then inform the Planning Commission on, on, on the environmental issues they have to weigh. Uh, with that, I will also let you know that uh, per the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, it is essentially my responsibility in our divisions to uh, investigate and look at uh, studies that were provided by qualified experts whether it's in water, air quality, biological, cultural, those type of things I think you heard in the previous uh, uh, project uh, regarding the archaeological qualifications of an expert. So we do have those expert studies and reports available for our use. Those were then used to prepare the environmental document at hand. So we received a couple of comments. Why was an EIR not prepared versus an uh, initial study slash negative declaration? I mentioned this to the commission and I'll let the members of the public know too that we have a, a statutory requirements and guidelines per the California Environmental Quality Act to look at a variety of resources. And those resources essentially range from what I call A to W because there is no Z. And that, you know, you'll look at aesthetics, air quality, biological, cultural, water, water supply, water quality, traffic, the whole gamut. 
So uh, we prepare uh, an initial document called initial study, and in that study we address all of those questions and issues and resources and whether or not they're going to be adversely impacted to the degree that the next level, a more robust document, an environmental impact report has to be prepared. So following those expert studies, uh, it was uh, determined that feasible mitigation is available. So that then brought it to the level of, of an environmental uh, a negative, mitigated negative declaration. So uh, the commission does have our response to comments that uh, there's a little bit more detail on, on page 11 at, at responses 9.1 and 9.2. So a question was also raised, well, you know, this thing has been going on for a little bit, you know, are the studies outdated? Water, wastewater, who did them? Well, again, qualified expert prepared uh, the studies. Uh, it, it really has not been that long if you look at, I'll give an example, traffic. Uh, if you look at the growth rate of what's going on in Tulare County and the impact that's, that uh, the growth rate will have, let's just call it 3% for sake of conversation, in, in, in a traffic study that, that most that you're going to grow is going to be another 3% annually. So it's, the possibility is there that it may have increased. However. <laughs> When the traffic study was done, it was also submitted to Caltrans, the expert, uh, in, uh, that would impact a, a, a state facility, no matter where that point of origin is of a project. And uh, our, our own internal department, Public Works Department, Roads Division. So it was determined that the study is valid, that it's still credible, that the information is not outdated. Same thing goes with water and uh, water supply. The other thing I wanted to point out too is that water was prepared by Roberts Engineering, a qualified expert. Another th concern was raised, well, what if there's not enough water? Tulare County Environmental Health Services Division has to approve the water supply, the water quality, and everything that goes with it in order for this process to continue moving forward. Uh, it's a 10 phase uh, subdivision, uh, so every time they get to the next phase, they're gonna have to make sure that supply and quality are there. Uh, a concern was raised uh, regarding notice and requirements, and I, I can feel that. Uh, our state law and county planning policy requires us to uh, notify folks within a 300-foot radius uh, of the property. And you think, wow, it's a pretty substantial acreage out there. 300 foot may not be enough. What we do is we, we notify in a couple of ways. All those properties that are adjacent within the 300 foot, we look at the assessor's tax roll. That's the most current information that we have, and we send out notifications. We do that. We also notice in the, in the newspaper of, of, of general circulation, which is the Visalia Times Delta, that covers the whole county area. They are uh, certified to, to do that, what they call a newspaper of general circulation. We did the noticing requirements consistent with Subdivision Map Act law. We did it with county policies, and we did it with uh, uh, um, uh, mail outs. So we, we, we did fulfill that requirement. So we did, if you go to the next slide, Mr. Bach, please. Uh, we received comments, of course, you know, through testimony and, and, and mail. Uh, we received 26 total comments and, and or statements. So those are, uh, we believe, to the extent that we could, responded to in the response to comments. Uh, we received seven agency letters. So they are aware of the, that's going out there. The Valley Air District, Cal Fish and Wildlife, uh, formerly Cal uh, Fish and Game, Caltrans, uh, Department of Conservation, Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board, Central Valley Flood Protection Board, and, and the Native American Heritage Commission. So with that, I want to turn it over to Aaron Bach. He's the uh, chief of the, of the Planning and Processing Division, and he will provide additional elaboration on my summary. Thank you, Hector. <coughs> Chairman Diaz, Commissioners, I am Aaron Bach, Chief Planner with Tulare County. Um, I'm going to basically bunch these uh, issues have been brought up through the comments into uh, their general resources, and uh, I'm going to address them as quickly as I can for you. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, before uh, Mr. Bach proceeds, it should be noted that a very detailed memorandum has been prepared uh, from Chuck Przybilski to the Planning Commission, which in writing identifies the comment and the responses, which has been distributed uh, to your commission and also made available to the public. So Mr. Bach is really summarizing the detailed responses that have already been provided. Um, one of the first issues that was brought up was the aesthetics um, and one way that this project is self-mitigating 
is because of the Foothill Growth Management Plan, there's policies within that plan, as stated in the ism &D, that do basically become the project features. Um, one of those in the uh, FGMP is the 100-foot um, the setback from the center line of the street. So no buildings will be built within that uh, area. That, that's one of the major uh, qualifications of this project that get us over that, that hurdle or that impact. So it's less than significant impact. Um, the other aspect of this project is the uh, lighting. People were concerned about glare. Um, there's no doubt that new lights will create uh, a, an impact. Now it becomes less than significant because the, the lighting is forced downward and there's not so many uh, reflective surfaces within this project that you will have that glare effect. It is set back quite a ways from the, the um, roadway. Agricultural operations. Uh, some questions have come up in regards to the Department of Conservation and their concerns and uh, other concerns about the loss of farmland. Um, this project was never, this area was, this zone, zoned land was never intended to be farmland. Um, <clears throat> from the very beginning it's been zoned as a, a, a use that is a development purpose. So with that um, there is less than a significant impact to farmland. <clears throat> it, it will, because of its current zoning, um, <clears throat> have less than a significant impact to the surrounding farmer, farming operations and any other Williamson Act contracts. And the farming operations affecting the new res residents in regards to pesticides, spraying, dust, there is a right to farm act in this county and therefore it will <clears throat> again be self-mitigating self through regulation. Biological resources. <clears throat> now, uh, some questions have come up about the uh, expert testimony given by um, the biologists who went out to the site back in 2006. <clears throat> Having read the report, the biological evaluation that occurred on the site, it was a very thorough evaluation. The biologist did transects over the site, mapped the areas in which he did traverse the property, and then went back months later to see if any other uh, species uh, occurred on the site, looking for all the major species that were defined um, in that area in the CMDDB research. <clears throat> None were found. Um, what they did find was that the land is highly developed in terms of biology. I mean, it's a highly developed agricultural site. Cottonwood Creek is, for the most part, a uh, maintained uh, water course, so there was no riparian habitat within that area. That's in this record. So, by a qualified expert. Um, the circulation, as far as the traffic study um, and Caltrans comments, uh, as Hector stated, um, there's no reason to believe at this time there's, uh, there's been such growth that the traffic study is no longer valid. And Caltrans did not say that in their comment letter. What they did say was they had some questions about the study itself, um, about the directions at the intersection at SR 216 and Millwood Drive. Basically, they were looking for a uh, north-south study. And they said, basically, it's an east-west study. That's uh, not in the record. <clears throat> what they did is because the two roadways, and we talked to the expert here, the two roadways are at a diagonal. They basically lumped the study, the uh, patterns together so that um, <clears throat> it doesn't, uh, the counts are there. The traffic counts are in that study. They're just, instead of being spread out between the two directions, they lumped them into one direction. Um, I had some concerns about that too, and I did look into it, and I did talk to the uh, expert on this. So <clears throat> that should... Um, once we relate that to Caltrans, satisfy their desire to see, uh, a, a no, take another look at that intersection. The peak hour factor, 0.88 versus 0 0.92. 0 0.88 is a rural standard. 0 0.92 is, a, if you want to say, a more conservative standard. That's for urban areas. In other words, they took a more conservative approach. So if they're saying the level of services go from A to B in a, under a conservative standard, if they took the rural standard, it would obviously be less. And then the uh, synchro data, <clears throat> that data itself, um, again, we don't feel changes that much over time. 
I think what they were really looking for, Caltrans was really looking for, is the intersection data, and I think this could be fairly explained away to them um, as far as the model. Again, they did not ask for any mitigation measures, and they did not ask for uh, state anything in the record that <clears throat> they found this uh, studies to um, determine that would be a significant impact. This is still less than significant impact. But for the ISM and D, the area is highly developed for agricultural purposes, and the Chris report that's in the record shows less than significant threat to this resource. Go on. Uh, hydrology, um, the stormwater runoff, that's calculated by an engineer and will be contained, filtered, and then run into natural waterway for the state's and the county's regulations. As far as impacts to Cottonwood Creek's water quality, again, that's regulated by the Regional Water Quality Control Board and by the county. So as engineered by this project, there will be a less than significant impact to Cottonwood Creek. And then there is the issue of potential flooding of Cottonwood Creek, which will be taken into account when, and it was taken into account when they designed this project. So those are made for the requisite storm um, <clears throat> level. Uh, so that the buildings are set away from that. The bridge will be designed out of the floodplain. And uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in a second about that. But that is for the Central Valley Flood Protection Board and Regional Water Quality Control Board and for our county and state standards designed out of the floodplain. The project will be designed out of the floodplain as will be the bridge. Go ahead. <clears throat> water quality. A lot of questions about water quality, especially in regards to septic. Um, uh, what? Quantity. Oh, sorry, quantity. We'll go quantity and then we'll go quality. There's a lot of questions about water quantity right now. Um, <clears throat> there was a, uh, per the policy of the county, there was a water supply sustainability report showing sufficient water as of November 2013. There is no doubt that we are in a state of diminishing water supply. Um, <clears throat> but these water studies take average amounts. I mean, if we take a look at when the water is at too high a level, we're bound to approve projects that might not necessarily have the water supply available to it at the time. If we take it to, at a too low a level, again, we're, we're taking a snapshot in time. <clears throat> as Hector stated, as this project moves forwards, as these lots become available, there's going to be <clears throat> a, uh, the county oversight. Our environmental health division will, first of all, permit the two pumps that put water into the project. They obviously can't uh, produce any homes without those pumps being in place. <clears throat> if we are still in a drought condition, I think the study that will have to be provided by the uh, applicant um, at that point will be looked at by our, our own environmental health folks, and they will make a determination at that time. So moving forward, still have the checks and balances in place to allow this project to move forward even with, any, with uh, no additional mitigation measures or conditions of approval. We still have, a, as I said, the final authority to grant the permits at the time of use. Good. Water quality. Again, there's a sustainability report. There was uh, quite a few borings, 80 borings taken on this project. They have the data. They understand the water conditions, uh, the groundwater condition. They do understand um, how good or bad it is. And given that, the engineering um, that is required for those septic tanks is to the standard of the state and our own county standard. So the actual water quality at that time, the base, baseline groundwater data will be judged uh, in according to the engineering standards that are required for those actual septic tanks. That's a higher standard than just your regular old septic tank. We have a comment by the Regional Water Quality Control Board suggesting more studies necessary based on general orders that have been passed since 2013. These will be done by the applicant when they are seeking county approval of the septic permits. So not only are you going to have the engineered septic tanks, you're going to have a study looking at the um, feasibility. Um, what the comment was that we did not have any feasibility studies in the record. Those will be provided by the applicant uh, when they do seek uh, permits for the septic. Go ahead. Well, that'll be a condition. Uh, if it doesn't, if it's if it doesn't show adequate, then you will not allow the project. Is that correct? Correct. So it's another check. Correct. 
public utilities and infrastructure, fire protection. Um, as stated, the county fire will cover this area from Woodlake. Uh, sheriff protection is from the county. It is from Visalia. The electricity provider is PG&E. Um, so with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Chuck, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bach. Thank you, Mr. Bach. The recommendation uh, from staff is a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors for the Planning Commission, and that recommendation is to, in two motions, one is to recommend adoption of the mitigated, de mitigated negative declaration and monitoring program, and to uh, recommend approval of the tentative track map uh, to the Board of Supervisors. And with that, that concludes staff's presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that the commission may have. Questions? Now you need a timeout? Sure. Okay. I knew this was coming. Uh, then if, since staff is done, we're going to take a uh, five-minute uh, break for Mr. Whitlatch and convene here back to business. When, when they go in, <clears throat> So. Okay, thank you. We will reconvene the Planning Commission meeting and um, staff has finished their uh, presentation. We will open it up to the public testimony portion. Uh, I want to remind people, and by the way, we've got a good turnout here and I appreciate people taking your time because uh, public hearings don't, don't work very well if the public doesn't participate. But um, I want those that weren't here last week or two weeks ago to rem to, to be reminded that we had a full full on meeting last night or last or two weeks ago and we covered many items on the thing there and uh, when I open up the testimony I want to hear new stuff but we had uh, if you're going to speak on uh, traffic impacts septic system impacts uh, water availability water quality uh, ag pre preserving ag noise impacts air quality security uh, erosion and water flow, fire su suppression and response. Uh, we've had those testimonies already and in fact were addressed <clears throat> here uh, either in our documents or uh, in the summary that Mr. Bog did. So let's keep any uh, testimony that we have here to new stuff. I invite all new stuff, but I don't want to go over stuff that we've already had uh, for the record uh, because it's, it's, it's been recorded so we have it. Okay, um, I want to start with um, the uh, applicant or their representative, if uh, I'd like to come forward. Good morning, everybody. I'm Bill Roberts of Roberts Engineering. Been involved in this project for about 12 years, and uh, I'm very comfortable with it. And uh, uh, feel very strong that it should be approved. If you have any questions, I'd be very happy to go over them with you. I had one for you, Bill. Last time we, well, I mentioned about the possibility of scaling down the number of lots. Any consideration for that? Well, when you consider the number of lots per the gross size, it is scaled down quite a bit. and. Uh, how big a, of a lot do people want to maintain? How, how big of a yard do people want nowadays? Uh, when you got the view of all the surrounding mountains and the foothills right there uh, out your window, uh, uh, I'm comfortable that the lots are big enough to sustain the septic systems. And, and the uh, septic systems are kind of the ultimate of recycling water and leaving it right on site. And, uh, I totally believe in it. It's it's going to work. So, thank you, Mr. Roberts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I have a confession, just in case. All right. I'm starting to feel a little guilty. I don't think of it now, but uh, 
Lori Pauly uh, is my graphics person. Now she makes me pay dearly for her time. I pay her. And so I don't think I have a conflict here. Matter of fact, she overcharges me, so I probably, <laughs> but uh, I don't see that as a conflict, but it's up to the. The uh, commission would allow just a, a brief uh, three minute recess for me to consult regarding this matter and I'll, I'll uh, I will um, render an opinion okay afterwards if that's all right all right thank Good. you we're, we're recessed for three minutes I never thought about it for now but wait okay come to order please find your seat thank you uh, we will reconvene the Planning Commission meeting with the city uh, with the County Council. Thank you uh, uh, Commissioner I would recommend to avoid the appearance of impropriety because we would have a quorum without Commissioner Whitlatch I would recommend recusal in uh, of this matter due to the existing uh, business relationship Okay, I would recuse myself and uh Lori, tell your neighbors it's your fault. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, should I stay around for the rest of the meeting? Is there no, we, why don't you leave the, uh, the, the dais? Uh, why don't you, oh, shall you leave for the rest of the meeting? Yeah, this is the last item. Out of there. Oh, 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 that's right, we've got. Okay. That's right, no. Still here. <laughs> we'll take your jack. I wasn't, forgot about the rest of that. I apologize, I didn't realize it until she stood up. And, Okay, thank you. Uh, I apologize for the delay, but that's procedure. All right, uh, we'll open up the uh, public testimony portion. Um, is there anybody else in favor that would like to speak at this time? Okay, seeing none, we will open up to anybody else uh, for or, or, or against that would like to come forward and uh, keep in mind, uh, as I said earlier, let's have some, some new information for us. Okay, my name is Lori Polly. I live at 19399 Avenue 364, Woodlake, California. We put together a packet for you guys that uh, I know at the last meeting, a lot of you were curious as to where we lived in relationships. So if you look on this map that's in this binder, it will show each residence and where we're at and a good part of us are here. And then there's also um, parts referring to each person statements and and et cetera, et cetera, and so on. So you guys can review that. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, Ms. Polly, uh, when, once we receive them, they're ours, right? Yes, they're yours. You get okay. to Thank cherish you. them forever. Where she lives <laughs> in graphic. Um, I guess you only need six since Bill went off the grid. Okay, um, I have a, a brief statement, and all of us have, we've had several meetings about this, and we've gotten together, and we've, we've limited it to one person to address each issue that we feel is important to us. Um, as a group, I'm, I'm, this was my little thing I'm presenting. Um, when we reviewed the 388 page document, uh, it says, this is one of the questions we'd like to put forth. The subdivision is scheduled to occur in 10 stages, which is on that map, um, with the first two stages located on the east side of Cottonwood Creek, with both wells located on phase one. While the water retention tank for the community water system is located on common area B at about the seven to 800 foot mark at the back of, the, at back of phase nine. So this being said, uh, our question is, is when construction begins and what we understood of the, the 388 page thing, that um, all of that infrastructure is gonna have to be in there. So are they gonna have to put the bridges in to access that tank and if that's the case if some of those lots don't sell for 10 years what's going to be done about erosion and water runoff and all of that while those la that's sitting there and it's been graded and everything so that was a concern for us um, as to how that was going to proceed so that was my 15 Excuse seconds me. of thing thank Sorry you to interrupt do you have an extra binder because yes Aguilar. i do 
I sure do. Here you go. Thank you. Thank and you, then um, we have some others that would like to speak, and sure. uh, they will be coming forth. Morning. Good morning. Uh, my name's uh, Steve Terstegi. Uh, I'm a uh, lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. I just happened to be out here on leave uh, visiting my dad. He's pretty sick. Um, and then I, I got involved in these meetings, you know, when I came out. So my uh, area of expertise in the military is I, I'm a strategic planner by, by trade. So in, in looking at what we have here, uh, how the, how the vision is laid out, uh, and not really looking at the, the specific details and have we met all the criteria for EIRs and the detail is, 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 uh, is another matter. So what I'm going to talk to you about is the planning aspect, about carrying out the vision uh, that you set forth in your own, in your own documents. So uh, I, I grew, grew up in Elderwood. Um, Expect to return there when the nation no longer requires my service. And it's the fundamental character uh, of, of the rural environment that, that's something that's you know, part of the, the history and, and it's part of the, uh, the future that, you know, a, a, as you see it. And it, it changes some, but not dramatically. And this is a dramatic change. Um, and, but, and that's not something that, that I am, you know, making up. I'm, I'm looking at uh, the uh, Tulare County Board of Supervisors um, General Plan 2030 update that was that was approved on August 28 uh, or August yeah August 20th 2012, uh, and and in looking at what is proposed here, and looking at uh, what it says in the update, th this is not something that is self mitigating, um, because what we're doing here mostly is looking at are we doing things right? Are we meeting the requirements? Are, are we hitting all the things in, in the checklist? But re you really got to step back and ask yourself, are we doing the right thing from a broad sense? So the, uh, the plan has a stated intention up front. It says, quote, to promote healthy, sustainable growth while protecting ag agricultural lands by directing growth to urban areas, unquote. So under the plan's framework, principle four of the guiding principle ex explicitly states, quote, strictly limit rural residential development potential in important agricultural areas outside of unincorporated areas, um, hamlets, uh, city OEBs, UDBs, i.e. avoid rural residential sprawl, unquote. So the spirit of the plan is to avoid the slippery slope of rural development, which you know, it, which starts as one, with one subdivision, with one proposal, then unintentionally evolves into a concentration of the county's population that eventually becomes a drain on the county's resources because it's in an unincorporated area. So, so, me, so meanwhile, what started as a single act of small development in a rural area uh, turns out to forever change the fundamental character of the rural landscape. And this has happened many times in the, in the past in the county, and I think we could probably think of stark examples um, of, of how rural spaces, without the proper long-term vision, became something we never intended. So now that the Board of Supervisors General Plan has clearly articulated principled growth management for the county, it is clear that in order to be deliberate and diligent uh, and direct development away from rural areas, uh, and I, I have not heard anything compelling that would, where the costs of this would outweigh the benefits. So, therefore, I strongly oppose the development of Elderwood Heights. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Damon Robert Terstegi. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm here sir, what was your last name again? Damon Robert Terstegi. And uh, I, I was going to speak about EMS um, responses and fire. Uh, it, it is not covered by the county or Wood Lake. It would actually be covered by CAL FIRE being on Colvin Mountain. Uh, I'm a professional firefighter. I have been for 14 years, seven with the federal government, seven with the state. 
And <clears throat> during the summer, that, that's fine. But in the winter time, Cal Fire shut down because it's our staffing drops. It were Schedule B, which is Wildland Urban Interface. So therefore, winter months, uh, say it's February, it's Wednesday morning. Well, you know, Woodlake Fire District is mutual aid. So if they're on a call, you would have your next in would be would go to the county. Your closest engine would be in Ivanhoe, Station 8. Their response time is about 12 minutes. I know this because I'm also a paid call firefighter with Station 8. And I was also out of Woodlake. The county engine uh, staffed uh, at Woodlake is not staffed. It's just totally volunteer. So therefore, the next engine <clears throat> would be out of Lemon Cove, which is at least 20 minutes. And you also have an uh, uh, ambulance post there as well. So that, that's 20 minutes as well. So for the whole area of Woodlake, Badger, Three Rivers, Ivanhoe, Farmersville, the parks, um, they, there's only three ambulance units. So, so they're, they're already stretched pretty thin. And if you were to have this, it's just you, there's more people, more staffing. Um, I, I don't know. You know, the county's already kind of stretched thin as it is. And also with, with, um, with county fire, there's only one person. That's it. Everybody else has relied on, on volunteers. So, again, if it's, you know, um, during the winter months, county's responding, and it's during the weekday, you're not going to get too many people, you know, there to help out. And you have that many homes on the side of a hill. There's dry conditions, especially if they're mobile homes, pre-manufactured homes. There, there's no sprinkler system. Um, in new homes, residential homes, there, there's a, there's a, it's now a, a law that to have sprinkler systems. Well, in pre-manufactured mobile homes, there is no such thing. So if there were a fire, it, it, would, it would spread very, very quickly, very rapidly. And um, <clears throat> due to the water supply, I, 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 I just I see it being, being a bad thing. Um, <clears throat> so reading here, that the proposed developments, fire services, as currently allocated, would be the responsibility of the state of California because of the state's response area provided by CAL FIRE during the summer months when they surge uh, staffing for a maximum wildland fire and urban interface. During the rest of the year, fire response is covered mainly by Tulare County Fire Department volunteer firefighter assets, as, as I was saying. Um, <clears throat> further fire protection requirements outside city limits re would require more county fire protection EM EMS assets. An additional fire concern is that Elderwood Heights is zoned for non-permanent structures such as mobile homes. The key concern being the south aspect of Colvin Mountain, which is an intimate fire danger because of the persistent dry grass conditions, possible constant wind being up on a mountain. Usually there's a constant breeze. Um, upslope during the day, downslope at night, which, which carries fire. Um, any, any fire that occurs will likely quickly spread throughout the homes and unrestrain the rest of the mountain. So I just... In my professional opinion, I, I could, if things were aligned correctly, um, it, it could be, it could be disastrous. Especially when you have that many people, that population, access egress is very limited. You have, you know, a couple ways in and out, panic. People are trying to, you know, leave, and you got emergency vehicles responding and trying to get up this hill. And you know, a, a fire engine is very heavy when you're carrying a thousand um, gallons of water you know, eight pounds per gallon. So it's, you know, trying to get up that hill and, and the response times, um, I just, I, I don't see it being. Thank you. Very good. And on a personal level, I, I, I don't know where everybody lives, but if this were to happen in your backyard, how would you feel about it? You're saying you live in Three Rivers, sir? Yes. If this were to happen on the mountain behind your house, how would you feel? Thank you for your time. I have a question. When's the last time that mountain burned, by the way? Bolden Mountain? <clears throat> um, I think about four years ago. Uh, Woodlake Mountain goes up almost annually. Um, Stokes Mountain nearby. Venice, Venice Mountain, um, om almost yearly. So it's just, and, and <clears throat> that's an excellent question. So the more people 
the more fire danger, the more, you know, causes for, for things to get going and being up there on the side of a hill and running uphill, um, yeah, it would, wouldn't be a very good situation. Any, any further questions? Concerns, comments? Yes, I have one. Um, doesn't Woodley Fire District's automatic aid go out to Avenue 360? Uh, a, a mutual aid agreement, they, they, they would drive out there. No, mutual aid, I know, but doesn't their auto aid go out to 360? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not positive. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Robert Piercy. Uh, I have property, uh, we have property at 35028 Millwood Drive. I'll correct the recent, uh, previously they called it Millwood Road. It's Millwood Drive. Wood Lake, just south of the proposed development referred to as Elderwood Heights, which is not in Elderwood either. <clears throat> I hope I'm not repetitious here today. I didn't attend the last meeting, and I'll try to keep it as non-repetitious as possible. The dream of all homeowners is to have their very own little paradise where they can relax and enjoy life. I can picture people moving to this development with a sales pitch drawing them to their very own home site on a hillside overlooking the creek, and being able to look up at the Sierra Nevada mountains and see the snow-capped peaks. But do we honestly really need a housing development of 160 plus sites with hundreds of people, hundreds of cars, hundreds of outdoor lights, noise, dogs and cats and every other form of animal, potential increase in crime and all the other potential problems that come along with the development? I really truly think the answer to that has to be no. Today I want to address just one item, and that's the fact that water and waste flows downhill. I'll be polite and didn't say what else could flow downhill, but in the 225-acre parcel, if this was to remain in farm and grassland, and it is currently right now was in orange trees, and the orange trees are being taken out as we speak, if this was to remain in farm and grassland, the runoff of rainwater in a wet rain year would be very significant. Cottonwood Creek occasionally has been known to have a very, very good flow of water. In recent years, a flood washed out two bridges in this area and caused considerable downstream damage on the other side of Culver Mountain, almost four miles away, where I have my home. And that, at that time, it flooded the creek and flooded through the orange orchards and all the way through our yard and our house, four miles away from there. In recent years, this damage has been considerable, but this doesn't happen every year, of course. Now consider what happens when roads are added to a housing development, and it covers these roads cover up land that normally would have taken rain runoff rain to soak into the ground as best it can on that hillside. Construct home sites with yards and landscaping and carports, outbuildings, driveways, and you lose more surface area. Now consider have, having, to move, having to move soil in order to make a home site. Every site up here, you gotta remember this is a 10% slope. It falls from a high of 800 foot elevation to 500 feet at the creek bed, at the creek level. So in that area, approximately one quarter of a mile from the lowest point to the highest point, it falls 300 feet. You get a 10% slope. In order to build a house, you're going to do a heck of a cut and fill. When you cut and fill, you take off the topsoil where this, that used to hold water, and you are now down to bare rock. Now construct a septic system in the area and put in leach lines. I've built many leach lines myself. I've helped people build a number of them. And I can tell you for a fact that sooner or later leach lines fail and they start coming up to the ground, up to the surface. In due time, I don't care what your engineers tell you, if you build a leach line in a rock system, sooner or later the water flows out. The septic tank, the septic system fails. 
Your engineer leach lines will be in rock, no matter how you do it. That hillside's rock. Water waste flows downhill. Eventually, the waste from one leach line is potentially going to get into another and into another and into another. And eventually, at the bottom of the whole thing is the creek. I've read the reports that guarantee that engineered leach lines will prevent waste from reaching the creek. The truth is, folks, not one of your engineers and anyone in this room can guarantee that fact. You can't not guarantee that. Whatever flows off of the roads, if it goes into a leach system or a basin, a catch basin, whatever you wish to call it, sooner or later ends up in Cottonwood Creek. Drive up and down that area and see what it looks like. If your home site's the highest portion on the development, way up on top of the hill, you have no concern about what happens to your wastewater. You have no concern. The guy below you might. I think if I lived at the top, you wouldn't worry about it. If you live at the bottom of the site, you might worry about what's coming down the hill at you from 162 or so developments or 160 plus developments. None of the folks here, as far as I know, none of you folks live in this area where this development's going to be. None of you have to look up on the hill and potentially see the lights, hear the noise, see the traffic come out. As far as I know, you don't live out there. I'm not sure you've gone out there and looked at it. Have you? Any? Anyone looked at it? Absolutely. Okay. You have seen it. Yeah. It's... it's uh, I, I would really challenge you that, you know, put yourself in our position, the folks that are here today. If you're living in that area, do you really want to wake up in the morning and look out at a stream of traffic coming off the hillside? 162 sites. Every single site has a potential of two cars plus. Now add the school buses, add the emergency uh, response people who will come and go. Uh, it's not a pretty sight, folks. It really isn't. That area is agricultural. I strongly recommend that you do not degrade the quality of our life in that area by putting a housing development like this proposed is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Piercy. So far, the last two comments have been stuff that we've covered last uh, time and the county responded to. So uh, I don't want to have to limit the time for each speaker, but I'm asking you to keep it to new business, okay? Thank you. Um, I'm Bill Ferry, um, 36201 Millwood Drive, Wood Lake. And um, in 1912, my great grandparents moved to Wood Lake to help build the streets in the town. They loved the area and they made it their home. The next year they purchased the property they grew up on and planted 40 acres of Washington Naples. We celebrated our 100th year anniversary last year and I sell the fruit in farmers markets throughout the valley and in the Bay Area. Our family has subsequently purchased additional properties on both sides of Cottonwood Creek and continue to farm them today. The original wells were dug by hand and were very shallow but with additional development of agricultural and housing, the water tables have dropped dramatically. Growing up in a rural area was a lot of fun. My best friends were my horse and my dog. When I would dismount or fall off my horse, a friendly neighbor would always come by and help me get back on. When I got a little bit older, I would walk up Cottonwood Creek with my 22 rifle to the Elderwood store and buy a box of ammunition, then walk back home. There were very few houses on either side of the Cottonwood Creek, and at uh, that time, I never had any issues with neighbors while shooting my gun because there weren't any. I'm a farm manager and a licensed pest control advisor and um, pest control operator as well. I farm and consult about 2,500 acres of olives and citrus in Tulare County. In 33 years of spraying orchards, I have experienced three complaints with spray drift to, agricultural, uh, to the Agricultural Commissioner. One was completely unfounded. The other two were in the same ranch, which, um, ranch where houses were developed on three sides of a 20-acre citrus orchard. 
the people who purchased the property were aware of the adjacent orchard and the right to farm notice, but chose to build their houses anyway. After the first complaint, I tried slowing down the fan speed to prevent the overspray. After the second complaint, I stopped spraying the rows on all of the borders. This eliminated about four acres of profitable oranges and ultimately led to the removal of the orchard. On the same orchard, the neighbors would not properly dispose of their couches, chairs, tires from their backyards. Instead, they would throw them over the fence into our orchard. When I reported the mess to the police, they told me I had no legal recourse and I had to pay for the removal. I'm a pest control advisor for the properties on the north and south boundaries of this proposal project, and I'm very concerned. First of all, irrigated agriculture land is regulated by the Regional Water Quality Control Board. This means that all the irrigated ag land is subject to uh, testing and water runoff from the property into any estuary for fertilizers and pesticides. I assume that there will be a ponding basin to collect the rain water that will run off of this project. I have personally seen large volumes of water runoff uh, Kelvin Mountain. If not, we, the growers on Cottonwood Creek, are we going to be responsible for the contamination occurring from the housing development? So I know personally that housing developments, uh, people in their houses want to put on too much fertilizer and they want to put too, many, uh, too much pesticides to their properties. Are the agricultural commodities on the north and south and east going to suffer the same fate, abandoning the adjacent rows uh, bordering this project or leading to the abandonment of the farmland? Are the new residents going to dump the refuge on the adjacent property and steal from their neighbors? This is a big concern to all the landowners and residents of the area. I'd also like to know who is maintaining Cottonwood Creek. I too would urge you to go out there and see it. Uh, there are trees, shrubbery, overgrowth, uh, nothing's been done out there. And I can guarantee you that they cannot build a large enough holding basin to contain the water runoff off that mountain during a severe, severe storm. Um, and also, they're, they're talking about treating the water before any release into Cottonwood Creek. I don't think it's going to happen, folks. Thank you, Mr. Fern. Hello. My name is Cindy Feltz, and I'm representing my family. Um, we have been out, we've lived and farmed in the area for almost 100 years now. I'm fourth generation. My uh, kids... Uh, farm and my grandkids also um, our and I don't want to repeat what has been said before either but our, our uh, concern is the traffic and the um, the RMA uh, report that was issued in 2008 and we feel like in the last six years traffic has changed immensely in that time and uh, maybe a new report should be um, considered. I can remember being on, we live on Millwood, um, and I can remember going out and working with my dad when I was um, in high school, and three, four cars maybe went by during the day, and obviously it's changed since then, and it has changed a lot since 2008. Um, there are a couple, as it sounds like several people have been out to see this proposal, and You've driven the road, Millwood Drive, on the way up to Elderwood, and have um, realized there are a couple of pretty uh, um, turns that are quite, um, what would you call it? Sharp. Sharp turns, thank you. <laughs> and we, we have trouble with it just when we travel and take equipment, ag equipment back and forth from different ranches, but you put hundreds of more cars on that and it's going to get even scarier. We've seen, we've been, you know, close to having, you know, we've had accidents out there too. So I would really urge you to consider the traffic problem um, in addition to the water and all the other problems that we're addressing here today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Penny Kulon. I reside at 35247 Millwood Drive. I spoke at the last meeting. Um, I had submitted some concerns as well as submitting some more today. I understand we're under a time limit, so I'll just concentrate on water and wells. Um, 
As the landowner of property adjacent to the boundary of the proposed Elderwood Heights development, I am submitting the following additional concerns about this project, project subsequent to the Planning Commission public hearing on February 26, 2014. Based on the numerous issues, concerns, and questions submitted for the record on this project, I ask that an environmental impact report be done. There are too many potentially serious environmental impacts that are not addressed adequately in a mitigated negative declaration. So as stated earlier, I will just stick with the wells. Significant issues regarding wells in the proposed project. The information submitted for the wells seem to have many discrepancies. The mitigation monitoring plan exhibit 2C says the on-site wells located in well lot A and well lot B are to be established as a community water system. Are these wells on these lots? Has the application process through California Department of Public Health for this community water system even been started? The map submitted for the well sites contained on the 225 acres is such that you'll really such that you really can't discern where these wells are located on this 225 acres. Shouldn't the well sites be shown on the site plan? The facts reported on page five of the project documents stated, there were three wells tested for quantity and the combined flows were 158 gallons per minute. Where's the documentation to prove the flows on these wells? Which of the five wells were tested and where are they located? Robert Enterprises states that the wells can sustain and produce water for 365 days a year. These wells have, been, have only been used seasonally for agriculture. Isn't there a significant difference on the recharge rates on these wells when used for agriculture rather than daily constant use needed for residential community water systems? The water quality report from Roberts Engineering states test reports from both wells are attached. The attached nitrate test results all have different description names. Comp West of Millwood Nitrate 24, Bulk 2 Well Nitrate 28.7, Bulk Well Bulk 1 North Well Nitrate 9.5, Bulk 1 South Well Nitrate 21.9. Why is there no consistency with the map naming wells 1 through 5 and this other documentation having different description names? Mr. David Roberts, property owner applicant, stated during the February 26, 2014 Planning Commission meeting that he would idle seven wells. How many wells are there? The water quality report from Roberts Enterprise has no documentation from metals testing. This report shows no bacterial test information, such as total coliform and fecal coliform. This information is important for water being used as potable community water systems and needs to be addressed. Groundwater data was submitted from the Department of Water Resources Monitoring Network. This documentation shows data on wells one, two, four, and five up until February of 2008. The documentation for well three shows only data up until February of 1963. With the critical drought situation in California at this time, shouldn't well data be shown for the current time period, not from eight years ago? Well three data is from 50 years ago. Is this well really online and producing water? Chuck, I apologize, Chuck, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, so I don't want to slaughter it. Chuck, RMA Planning Branch, on page three of his report to the Planning Commission, dated March 12, 2014, in comment 1-3, water states, according to the report, existing well data shows that the water table has not substantially declined over the last two years, 2011 through 2013. Is he referring to the water sustainability report submitted by Roberts Engineering? How can he make such a statement from the well data I just questioned in the preceding paragraph that dated back to 2008 and 1963? Page eight, resolution draft 25 states, on-site water tanks shall be designated to support suppression system. The site map shows a location for a water tank for fire suppression. What volume of water in gallons is, is this tank to be? Page eight, resolution draft 25 states, a minimum fire flow for a six, excuse me, six inch hydrant is to be 1,500 gallons per minute for two hours. Can the wells really produce and sustain that amount of water? And as stated earlier, I have more concerns, but um, along with my previously, I'm sorry, along with my previously stated issues about traffic, noise, air quality, water use, aesthetics, lighting, 
I'm greatly concerned about the potential serious environmental impacts to, to be generated by this high density proposed project. My concerns have not been addressed adequately in the present mitigated negative declaration. I ask that this project be denied until a full environmental impact report has been prepared and presented for further public comment. Thank, Thank you. you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Ms. Kuhn. We, uh, we call it, Chuck is uh, Chuck No Vowels Brzezilski. So I know I told him when I went to school they taught us you had to have vowels to make a word. <laughs> I don't know how he I don't know how he gets away with it, but uh, that's, that's what he does. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, who else is coming up? Once again, if it's stuff that we've covered, keep it brief. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kevin Russell. I live at 19689 Avenue 364. That location is locally known as Dutch Colony. Um, my statement is on page B10 in the presentation uh, section. Um, the supporting documentation that I've brought is in a slightly different order. That's why I'm referring to it. Um, like I said, oh, first off, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Diaz and uh, Commission, for allowing us to speak today. Uh, my name is Kevin Russell. I'm a resident of Dutch Colony. I have a number of deep concerns re regarding the local impact from the Elderwood Heights development being allowed to move forward. The majority of these concerns are being addressed by my neighbors and I will be addressing the impact this can have on paleontology—that's big word for paleontological and archaeological resources on Colvin Mountain. I would like to bring to your attention uh, the Denton Mammoth. This specimen is number 121790 of the UC Museum of Paleontology. Uh, if you look on document E14, this is off the UCMP's website and it catalogs the uh, Denton Mammoth. The 10 foot mammoth tusk was discovered on the Denton Brothers farm on April 1st, 1965. The Denton Mammoth is one of only five mammoth finds that have been investigated in Tulare County. Uh, if you would like to look at item B13, uh, this lists uh, paleontological specimen finds in Tulare County, and I've highlighted the ones that refer to mammoths. And there have only been five in Tulare County. Uh, this specimen still resides at the UC Museum of Paleontology. It, the find actually consisted of two tusks, the previously mentioned 10-foot section, as well as a separate two-foot section. This was reported by the Visalia Times Delta on April 5, 1965. And that article is included in your packet. Um, item B15. Uh, this finding is still being referenced to paleontological resource assessments in Tulare County. Uh, I found a recent uh, resource assessment that was done for Road 80, and they mentioned the Denton Mammoth in their mitigation. Uh, I brought with me a, a mammoth molar, and the reason I brought this is because it's covered in varnish, and the reason for covering it in varnish is because these specimens are so fragile that if you don't cover it in varnish, it'll start to deteriorate. And if you can see on my paper here, pieces are all falling off of it, just bringing it in to show you. The, uh, Denton Mammoth, when it was recovered, uh, UC Berkeley spent three days excavating it. They covered the 10-foot uh, tusk section in plaster 
in order to be able to excavate it in one piece because they were so fearful of it falling apart. These are not things that you can hit with a backhoe. Uh, by the time you notice a, a section, that's all it is. It's a section. You've, the damage has already been done. Uh, another area of concern is archaeological. Um, because most of these hills in this area are private property, it's not always that easy to get on them to go explore. But I have uh, been on just about every hill in that area. I've been on Bacon Hill, the Twin Buttes, uh, Lone Oak Mountain, Sentinel Butte, and every single one of those have archaeological uh, Indian sites of some significance. Uh, I included a, a map, it's B12, and uh, it shows uh, Indian mortars and paintings, uh, Indian burial site that COS did in 1961, where they found an Indian skeleton uh, near Sentinel Butte. There's uh, pictographs and mortars, there's petroglyphs, um, the Antelope Valley has been recorded as the Yokut's possible creation site. It's very revered to them. Uh, if you were to go west off of this uh, map, it's not shown on what you have there, but you have Bacon Hill, the Twin Buttes. They've got uh, very well-preserved paintings, uh, petroglyphs. So when you look at the map and connect the dots, Everything surrounding Colvin Mountain has had archaeological finds. And I think we need to do due diligence to make sure that this is properly investigated, to make sure that there are not any burials, uh, uh, pictographs, anything that can be destroyed, vandalized, painted over. <clears throat> Once the ground is disturbed or paved over, it cannot be reclaimed. In 1949, during the construction of the Friant Kern Canal, a four-foot section of tusk was located under the reinforcing bar. It was broken into pieces in order to not disturb the rebar. The pour continued, and any further evidence of mammoths in that location are now under several inches of concrete. Uh, that was reported in the Exeter Sun in 1949, and I believe that article should be in your packet here. That's uh, item B11. In conclusion, paleontological resources are protected by state law. This protection covers all vertebrate fossils, animals with backgrounds, and any unique paleontological locality. The California Environmental Quality Act states that it is state policy to take all necessary action to provide the people of this state with historic environmental qualities. If paleontological resources are identified as being within the proposed project area, the sponsoring agency must take these resources into consideration when evaluating project effects. And I'd just like to read one brief statement uh, from a mitigation report that was done on Road 80. Uh, when they were doing this report, they found no evidence of fossils. During the survey, no fossils were observed on the surface in the project area. However, sediments conducive to preservation of fossils were observed. Paleontological resources are considered to be significant if they provide new data on fossil animals, distribution, evolution, or other scientifically important information. The project will impact sediments known to be sensitive for significant non-renewable paleontological resources. They had to go through a very extensive mitigation process for the Road 80 expansion, and no fossil evidence had been presented prior to 
the start of construction. We have fossil evidence in that area and it's very significant fossil evidence. One of only five mammoth finds in Tulare County. That specimen is still on display at UC Berkeley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Good afternoon, Commission. Um, my name is Steve Festerman. I work as a teacher. That's my job. I see one of my past students has got herself a job. That's awesome. Um, I can also read pretty good how it's going with people. And being a teacher, you often look out at your students and you can kind of get an idea. And I see that all of us talking, even though we're, you know, talking from our hearts and doing the best. And I know Mr. Diaz said, you know, don't bring up things that were talked about before. I understand that. I mean... You know, I wasn't here at the last meeting because a lot of us didn't even know about this going on. It kind of spread like wildfire in our little community. And the reason it spread like wildfire is because you're talking about doubling the population in Elderwood. You're talking about the 180 homes will match what's already there. I mean, there's only about 180 homes in the Dutch colony area. Again, it's not even named right. It's not Elderwood. It's Dutch colony. So I was contacted because I've worked as a biological consultant. My, I have a degree in biology. Um, my family has lived on Colvin Mountain for about, well, since 1940, so I'm the third generation living up there. And just like everybody's told you, if you haven't been out there, you're really missing out on a beautiful scene and a beautiful place to live with a great environment. I understand there's agriculture out there. There's orchards. There's um, a lot of, there's thousands of acres of grazing land around this property. Talk to John Vincent. He's concerned about the dogs that will be there that will run his cattle. Cattle lose weight. That's money gone from the ranchers. Who's going to cover that? Dogs tend to pack up in the winter when the ground's soft and they go out and they chase the cattle. They'll run down and kill the baby calves. When people move out there, you're talking almost 200 people, maybe 400 people. When they move out in this area, they're going to bring with them their animals. Their animals are going to have an impact. Um, again, I understand you've been sitting through a lot, so I'll, try to, I'll cut down this big paper. You have it in front of you. I, I've went and talked to other biological consultants. Um, when I talk to them... I'll just tell you what I found out as quickly as I can before I lose my, the class audience because I understand it's been a long morning and you can feel the emotion in this room. A lot of people are um, really concerned. Um, the ERI that was conducted by Dr. Wendell E. Wall back in 2006 was brief and by no means thorough. By no means thorough. I've lived up there my entire life. I was a little nature kid like Bill Furry. I covered that mountain. I've been all over Mr. Roberts back when it was the King Ranch. It was the King Ranch back in the 70s. I've been all over his property back when it was a jungle before they developed it back into orange orchards again. I can tell you about every single species of animal that lives on that mountain. This Dr. Window, Wall, whatever, he missed it big time. He didn't even come close. But then again, he was paid by Mr. Roberts to do this job. So he did his job and he went out and found what he was supposed to find, I guess. And it really needs to be looked at because if you look through your Department of Fish and Game, which I also contacted, they have some serious concerns about what's going on out there. Not just the concerns you've heard, but let me just give you, the department does, it says, in reading through Department of Fish and Game's wildlife report conducted by environmental scientist Steve Hobart and signed by Jeffrey Single February 28, 2014, I noticed many concerns they also had about the project. Here is the quote out of their findings. It says, the department does not concur that the project will not have significant impact on biological resources and continues to have concerns with regard to potential project-related impacts. It will have impacts. You, you're human beings. We're all human beings. I'm a scientist. You cannot put humans in an area where they're not going to have an impact. They will throw garbage. There's no way to control who moves in up there or what kind of homes they build. There's no way to control that once you as the commission okay this and turn them loose, there's no way you can control this. And I'm talking from a scientific point of view when I say, you know, we have, they didn't even mention the valley elderberry beetle, which is a federally listed species. There's elderberry that grows up and down Cottonwood Creek. It's a plant. It's a federally listed species. Not even brought into the, into the report. Um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife mentioned in the report the use of the mountain specific project area for both Foraging and nesting of the golden eagle, bald eagle, prairie falcon, white-tailed kite, a species of concern. White-tailed kites are found very seldom in Tulare County anymore. A biologist well-known from Visalia here, Rob Hansen, 
He runs a Christmas bird count every year where they go on a 15-mile a 15-mile radius and look for birds. He always comes to Colvin Mountain to get the white-tailed kite. Where is that kite, white-tailed kite located? Right over the Roberts property up above the rock wall out in the, they know where it is, up in the area where there's some old, for, um, old orchards that have been taken out. That's where the white-tailed kite spends all of his time. There's lots of animals that live out here. Um, you know, there's historical reports of kit fox and badger that have lived in this area. I saw a badger two years ago. Not mentioned in the report, of course, because he didn't see a badger, but they're there. That's a species of concern by the state. There's a lot of things that should have been addressed by this Dr. Walls that was not addressed. Um, there's everything that we've seen in the last year. We've seen bobcat, gray fox, coyote, long-tailed weasel, spotted skunk, striped skunk, jackrabbit, squirrel, cottontail rabbit, badger, raccoon, and many more smaller mammals. Some of the reptiles and amphibians that can be found in this area. Number one, and you're all going to love this, is the rattlesnake. If you, you can ask anybody that lives out in this area. If you're on that mountain, you're going to have rattlesnakes. I would love to see Mr. Roberts tell his new tenants, here's your new home site. Oh, and by the way, every summer when it gets hot, those rattlesnakes are coming into your yard. I wonder what a sales pitch that will do for that area. Because they are coming. And you hear the people laughing? Because I had nine at my property. I don't live but more than four or 500 yards from that property. So they're going to get rattlesnakes in the yard. And that's okay if you're country people and you were raised out there and it's part of your living and you're okay with it. Fine, but for most people moving out there, I'll bet they're not going to like to hear that. So again, we have night snake, gopher snake, western fence. There's so many different creatures out here. I don't want to waste your time. But again, look through the list. We're compiling, and I have a biologist working right now to compile a more thorough list than what was given by Fish and Game. There's plant species. The, the statement that there's no riparian left, don't get me wrong, it's been damaged. But there's riparian habitat along Cottonwood Creek. There's cottonwoods, there's sycamores. You, if you were out at this project right now, we could show them to you. There's willows, there's, it's still an ecosystem out there that they're getting ready to totally bulldozer over right now as we speak. They're working on the orchards with their big caterpillars and stuff now. Okay, so, um, Department of Fish and Wildlife report, the commission will see the developers saying the project will have less than significant impact Less than significant impact is what the developer is saying. That is not true. It's going to have an impact. All these species of animals, birds, whatever you want to talk about biologically, they're going to lose their homes. They're going to lose the corridor. The creek bottom works as a corridor for animals to make their way up and back and forth from where they go to their nesting or whatever they're doing. So, again, there's no way you put two gigantic bridges out in this nice little country area and it's not going to have an effect. It is going to have an effect, Commission, I promise you you are talking about a major effect on the wildlife and the other creatures and stuff that live out in that area. The pollution from the project, you've already heard that. I won't go over that again. It's in my paper right here that I wrote. Um, hundreds of new residents. Again, you're doubling the population of this area by letting this project go through if you so choose to do so. You're doubling the population out there. Um, they'll bring in their domestic dogs. Like I said, John Vincent was worried. He has cattle up there. He doesn't want the dogs up there. He's worried about people trespassing. When people move into a new area, they'll tend to trespass up the mountain and go where they want to go because it's just a fence, right? Um, in conclusion, I hope you can clearly see it is not as simple as just saying we are comfortable with it. I wasn't at the last meeting, but again, my wife came back with this, they're comfortable with it. How, do you, how does somebody be comfortable with what's about to happen? How are you comfortable with it? I just don't understand that. But they're comfortable with it, um, no matter what it's doing to their neighbors and everybody else. Um, Again, they're comfortable with it, as was stated in the meeting when Mr. Roberts responded to questions about the project. I am here today to ask the Commission to give some serious con consideration of the negative effects on the environment this project will have before moving on. I would ask for an IEP, uh, an environmental impact study, to be done. There was another one mentioned by another biologist, um, real quick. A wetlands delineation survey should be done. It hasn't been done yet, but they should find out where the wetlands are on that project. You do have um, tiger salamander on there. Again, that's a state species that's listed. Um, there's so many things that need to be addressed before this project ever should have got off the ground that hasn't been. And from a biological standpoint, this is a nightmare for that area, not just for the community and all the people you see in here today spilling their hearts out to you guys, hoping you're listening, because that's what we're all doing. We're spilling our hearts out to you, hoping you're listening. I know the developer doesn't care because it's all about the money, but for us, we're hoping you're listening to what we're saying. And again, can't stop progress while well, we're going to be here and try as long as we have to.
Because this is our homes. Like I said, 1940s, my family, you heard hundreds of years. We won't, you know these people won't be there if they put this big housing development they want. They'll get their money, but we'll all be gone. And some of us grew up our whole lives out there. And this is a major, major mistake to try to build this on that mountain. I hope you'll take into consideration all the rest of it. I didn't want to take up Mr. Diaz's time. He was Thank wanting you. us to be brief. So, again, that's as brief as I can be, but it's all in the letter, and we'll get you more as soon as we can. And I hope you'll give serious consideration to this. It was interesting being up here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Bilderman. Good morning, Chairman Diaz and Commissioners. My name is Craig Brion. I was retained by Tulare County Citizens for Responsible Growth to review the mitigated negative declaration. Um, I have given you a packet of information. It's a four-page letter and a number of attachments. I will be referring to it. I have a couple extra if you don't have it. It looks like this. It has TCCRG's logo on the front. I gave a copy to the developer as well, so he has it so that he can see it. I had hoped I could put it up on the screen, but evidently I can't. So if you could take off the paper clip, I'll be referring to the various attachments. First of all, my apologies that a lot of information is coming into this process late. I was asked to work on this starting Sunday. You can imagine that it's a lot of documentation to read and a letter to prepare and some documents to prepare in that amount of time. I spent 10 years on a planning commission myself in my hometown. And I know it is difficult to get a lot of late information and difficult, especially once you've delayed a hearing once to consider delaying it even again. But anyway, it is what it is. I started working on this only on Sunday and my apologies for the fact that this information is coming in late. And that said, we're asking that you do three things. One is to turn down the mitigated negative declaration because it simply doesn't provide adequate information and I'll go into it is violates the law. <coughs> uh, two, that you say that if any development on this site of any size is to go forward that it would require an environmental impact report. The couple of things that you really get out of an EIR that you don't have now is a very much more thorough response to comments. You heard a lot of comments coming up. And your staff, to their credit, they don't have to even respond to comments for a mitigated neg deck. It's not required by law. They did some, and that's to their credit. But you would get the biologist's response to comments, the water engineer's response to comments, the archaeological uh, person's response to comments. You would get a much more detailed response to comments if you go through the EIR process. The other major thing that you get is an alternatives analysis. I'm not sure. Some of these people may say that nothing should develop on this property. Others of them probably feel that some amount of development would be okay. What an EIR gives you is an alternatives analysis that might show you an alternative that preserves all the hillside areas and, and moves things down towards the creek. You'd still lose the farmland. You might see a different alternative that actually clusters things up in the hills and preserves the prime agricultural lands that are there. It would give you the opportunity to compare environmental impacts from different development scenarios. Um, I'm going to cover two issues primarily, loss of farmland and the aesthetic impacts. I believe, based on you know, the quick analysis that I've done, that they both show very fatal legal flaws in this document, and I can explain why. But I did want to mention that there's also a letter been submitted by one of the TCCRG coordinating com committee members, Jim Gordon. He and his wife are citrus ranchers out in um, Lemon Cove, and he knows this property fairly well. And he submitted comments on water supply and septic systems. And I wanted to just raise one fact from his comments. If you look at the notes on how the water supply was judged for this property, they say that they estimated the water usage on an average of 4,000 square feet of landscaping per lot. The average lot size in this development is 50,000 square feet. There is no condition in there that says you can only have 4,000 square feet of landscaping. You can put in an acre of lawn. You can put in an acre of vineyard. You can put in an extensive French gardens, whatever to assume that people with, on average, 50,000 square feet of space are going to put less than one-tenth of that into landscaping defies common sense. That's how you end up saying that there's only one-eighth the usage of water of this from the agricultural land. It may, in turn, it may end up that there would be less 
water usage from this than the agricultural, but it's not one-eighth, not even close. Two issues, farmland. So let's start with attachment A, which is your own standard on conversion of farmland. Um, what it says is, this is the checklist that you go through that then dictates what sort of analysis gets done. Would the project convert prime farmland, unique farmland, or farmland of statewide importance, as shown on the maps of the Farmland Mapping and Monitoring Program, to non-agricultural uses? If you say yes to that question, you have to check the box that says potentially significant impacts. You do not have a legal choice to check another box. But the box checked here says no impact. Now, why is that? Department of Conservation put in a letter. Take a look at attachment B. According to the Farmland Mapping and Monitoring Program, which your own standards say you must consult, there is 52 acres of prime farmland, 13 acres of farmland of statewide importance, and 107 acres of unique farmland. In other words, there is no way on this property to have not checked the box on potentially significant and led to an entirely different analysis than you got. So why didn't they bother looking at the farmland maps? Evidently they did. They do acknowledge, and you can ask your staff, they acknowledge that it's mapped. So I attached C and D. The D is just a blow up of C, and I put a circle roughly around the property. The areas marked in dark green are prime farmland. The areas marked in light green are farmland of statewide importance or unique farmland. It's all over this property. There is no question that it is mapped and it's there. So how did we arrive at a statement that says there is no impact? The answer comes from something your staff said earlier and repeated today. That this project, because it's zone PDFM, anticipates development. But unfortunately, that's a policy argument. If you, Mr. Diaz, wanted to say to you, Mr. Norman, I think we should develop this property because it's been slated for development for some time, as a policy position, that's perfectly understandable. As a legal sequel position, it's entirely illegal. You have to, under case law and CEQA itself, and this has been tried by other jurisdictions, you can imagine, they've tried it, they've lost. You have to compare the existing site conditions, those are known as the baseline conditions, to the anticipated future development scenario. The existing baseline conditions here are hillside, farmland, creek, farm buildings, including 36 acres of prime farmland, 12 acres of farmland of statewide importance, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the baseline conditions which legally you had to consider. You can't just dismiss them by saying the property under a general plan has been zoned for development. Imagine the results of that. Okay, we have zoned Antelope Valley for development as industrial. It's near Woodlake. If it happens to have 20 acres of wetlands on the valley floor, do species no longer live there? Does it no longer serve a water quality premise? Do we lose the environmental values of a site simply because it's been zoned? As I say here, did the zoning on this case magically change prime farmland soils to worthless dust? No. And you can't do that legally. Let me move on to aesthetics. Um, that would be attachment E. The standard is the one that's most applicable is standard C. Would the project substantially degrade the existing visual character or quality of the site and its surroundings which are open to public views. The, what was checked, and you can't see it, I wrote it in there, is potentially significant impact mitigated to a less than significant level. Now, first of all, this analysis suffers from the exact same thing I just mentioned. They say, well, it's expected that we'll have aesthetic impacts. They acknowledge, quote, a significant change in this landscape over virtually the entire site. They acknowledge that. But they say it's expected because it's zoned for development. Again, you can't do that. You have to compare the existing site conditions and their aesthetic value to the future site conditions under development. But there's even a worse situation here because the other reason 
that they say that this is a less than significant impact is that it, quote, would conform with all, let me go to it, all new development, this is attachment F, all new development will be constructed in compliance with zoning, uniform building code, and foothill growth management plan development standards. It's the last part there, foothill growth management plan development standards. And this is one of the reasons they cite why this is mitigated to a less than significant impact because it will comply with all aspects of the foothill growth management plan development standards. Now, you go five pages previous in the document and you come to my last attachment. Your own words here. Attachment G. In regards to consistency with the Foothills Growth Management Plan, the proposal does not conform to many of the implementation strategies and development standards in Chapter 3 of the plan. The proposal is lacking in innovative design and a cluster development approach. There is no promote, proposed community waste disposal system. I'll move on. There is no effective strategy to protect the Cottonwood Creek environs. The proposed lots will maximize disturbance of the project site, including cut and fill and blah, 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 blah. There is no protection of ridge lines, rock outcrops, or groves of trees. A portion of the site is designated Valley Agriculture, and it goes on. Okay, nine different areas of the Foothill Growth Management Plan that your own document says it does not conform. Nevertheless, your, your consultants and staff then say one of the reasons the aesthetic impacts are less than significant is that it conforms with all aspects and development standards of the Foothill Growth Management Plan. Your answer? <laughs> I almost thought that maybe the consultants and the staff hated this project too. And left this kind of thing in there because it's such an obvious error. I don't know. But you can't get away with it. Um, let me say finally what, again, what we're asking for. I think I've just shown you that in at least two areas, and there's more, if we have to go to the Board of Supervisors, I'll do a full legal memo on it. In these areas, this environmental document does not give you adequate information and does not comply with the law. Therefore, you should reject it today. Then you say next, and if you're going to come forward with a development proposal of anything like this size on this site, you'll need an environmental impact report. Because amongst other things, you're going to convert prime farmland. That's an automatic, potentially significant impact. And until they've either looked at avoiding that impact or mitigating by preserving land somewhere else to compensate, you have to have an environmental impact report to do that. As I said, you also get an alternatives analysis. This project, as you've heard today, and I hope you agree, is just too intense for this site. Why does it violate so many aspects of the Foothill Growth Management Plan? Because they're jamming too much stuff onto the site and they're converting most of the entire site to a different type of use. There are potential development scenarios that don't do that. An environmental impact report would give you the alternatives analysis with the community able to come forward and say, here's what we might accept. And could you please analyze this for us? We want to preserve most of the farmland. We want to preserve most of the hillsides, maybe not have the bridges, perhaps cluster the development right along the road there. You know, it would be a lot smaller, and the developer wouldn't like it as much. But at least the EIR gives the community the chance to bring forward something that they think would be, that they could accept with a lot less impacts. You don't get that with the documents you have now. It's simply way too large a development for this site. And even if it wasn't for the illegalities of it, I hope you would agree. It's just wrong for the area. Thanks. And I have a couple more copies if anybody needs them, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Beams. Here you go. Now that's what I call... Okay, that's the kind of new testimony I want to hear. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hector R. Rodriguez II. I'm a veteran in the United States Army, um, former Special Operations Special Forces. Um, the reason I bring this up is that when I came home, 
Um, Elderwood is a place of solace. It's a place that was able to emotionally heal after serving my country. From the jungles of Panama and Central America to the sands of the Middle East to the LA riots, Elderwood's been my home since 1966. I was born in 1966. Um, I was authorized by my family uh, to say that I'm here on, be on their behalf, which is also Hector D. Rodriguez, Mary J. Rodriguez, Lisa T. Rodriguez Feldman, Matthew Rodriguez Feldman, Jamie Rodriguez Feldman, Christopher T. Rodriguez, Maria Jose Rodriguez, Dominic Rodriguez, Malachi Rodriguez, Decimus Rodriguez, Dimitri Rodriguez, and Melissa Rodriguez. This is all blood family, my kin. Um, I'm also authorized by my family to state our corporations. California Outhouses Incorporated. I state that because I'm an expert in sewage treatment. I'm an expert in portable toilets, um, also leach lines and septic tanks. Who rolls downhill? In granite, it's not going to peripherate. I'm also the field manager for Calag. I supervise anywhere from 40 to 600 people on a given day. I'm also the sales manager for manager, excuse me, for Rancho Cuatro Caminos, meaning that we've been ranching. I'm the second generation, my son's the third generation. We have cattle uh, off of Cottonwood Creek right now. We got about, I'd say, 100, 150 head off Cottonwood Creek right there, uh, close to 37556 Millwood Drive. That's where I reside. Uh, we rent out the Hanks property, which is 80 acres, and then I have about seven acres right next to Air Dome's property. Uh, my parents and my brother reside at 37574 Millwood Drive, Woodlake, California. Uh, being born and raised in Elder, well, being raised in Elderwood, um, like Bill Ferry and Steve Besperman, I've roamed all them hills since I was a kid, either on horseback or on a bicycle or walking. There's a significant, uh, there's a significant archaeological uh, finds up there. I remember as a kid, there's places where Indians used to uh, mash their acorn on rocks, and the holes are still there. The other thing too is, as a rancher. At any given time, I have, we have 100 head of cattle on um, right off of, uh, Millwood Drive, off of Cottonwood. Dogs are a big issue for me. Uh, big issue to where we, uh, uh, I don't know how to say this uh, politically correctly, but I'll just come out and say it. We shoot all the dogs that come on our property. Reason being is that we have cattle when um, they're messing with our livestock, which is uh, registered black Angus. I'm sorry, your dogs, you know, it's like you can't stress my calves. I've lost... Uh, five head of registered board goats at $500 a pop due to a dog that kept on coming and kept on coming. Um, some city folk moved, moved out there and uh, just let their dog out at night to go over there and pillage and do what it wanted to. It killed five of our registered board goats at about $500 a head. Um, the other thing I'm worried about is theft. We, uh, we have cattle that probably have, uh, I'd say, about 200 head of sheep. That we usually find places to graze around Elderwood and about 20 head of horses. So uh, we, we are in the business of ranching um, and we do take care of our livestock. And we also right there in Elderwood off the Cottonwood Creek, we have pheasant, we have quail, we have dove and all sorts of other game. We also have on, on the 80 acres I'm talking about, we got at least one bobcat that resides there that we don't mess with and he doesn't mess with our livestock. Um, the other thing, too, is as a child growing up in Elderwood, it's always been a place of solace, some place where you can go home to, and no hustle, no bustle. I mean, some place where you can rest your head at night, leave the door open if you wanted to. And now it's changing. Uh, we had a, a, a lady be confronted with uh, somebody with a gun not too long ago. So crime's another thing. If you're going to bring in a hundred and some odd houses, and we don't know who's coming in, and you can't control that. Crime's going to go up. You know, if crime goes up, I, I got to hire people to keep an eye on my livestock. I got to hire people to keep, you know, keep an eye on my house. You know, before we don't have to do that. The other thing too is when I was a kid, right there, uh, going to the other grocery store, a car would come by. Maybe one car be every 
once every three hours. Now it's like hell. They think that it's a drag strip. We got a bunch of knuckleheads driving down that road thinking it's a, it's a drag strip. I mean, we got people towing um, these toy haulers going up into the mountains thinking they're doing 80 miles an hour where I got nephews roaming around on horses. The other thing, too, is I go into Dutch Colony, and when I go into Dutch Colony, I'm usually riding a horse, and I got about six nephews of, my, of, um, of mine with me, and they're on horseback. And, you know, if you put all these people out there, I'm not going to be able to, uh, to show my nephews to go out there to Dutch Colony and ride horses around that. It would be too, too dangerous for them due to the vehicle. But the one thing that I would ask you, too, to say no to this project, because you know what? Um, I am a veteran, and Elderwood has allowed me to, uh, to heal from the wounds that you can't see. And I've been through a lot of stuff because of my military deployments. And it's the only place on earth that I feel at home. And it's the only place on earth that I can lay on my, hate, lie on my head at night, go to bed, and not worry about nothing. Elderwood is our home. And I ask you to say no today because, you know, all he's caring about is the dollar. All he's, you know, caring about is making a buck. I care about my community. I care about Bill Ferry, Steve Fessman, all the people here. We're, we're, you know, Elderwood's like a family. We look after each other. And this man, I don't know where the heck he comes from. Where I come from, we take care of family. And I'd ask you to say no today. My family members aren't here, and I'm, and I'm ill-prepared, and I'm sorry because I barely found out last night about this here meeting. But I'd ask you to say no, because other veterans like myself live out in Elderwood, and we need the solace. We served our country. We did our duty. Now let us rest. Let us relax the place where we don't have to watch our back. Let us lie our heads at night where we ain't got to worry about somebody breaking through the window. And let our children and our children's children live in a beautiful community and grow up seeing the beautiful mountains like I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. You have anybody else? Okay. I see one gentleman coming up. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Roberts. I'm the uh, bad guy of the day, I guess. Um, I don't even know where to start. I, this isn't personal. Um, hey, hey. The uh, property's been farmed since about 1914. Wasn't here to see that, but I, that's what I understand. Uh, so as far as things being disturbed, it's been disturbed many times since 1914. So what is left there archaeologically, paleontology, probably not much. We're removing some trees, as they said, as we speak. Um, so it will be disturbed another time as we prepare to plant another crop. Um, my family bought the property. My family is a farming family, um, second generation. Sorry, I don't go back five, but we're second, second, working on our third. Plan on farming, we do farm. Uh, when we bought the property in the, in the late 80s, it was already zoned PDFM, uh, mobile home. My vision of the world, it wouldn't have any mobile homes on it. Uh, but I'm not a developer, I'm a farmer. Um, it's consistent with where the county wanted growth to go. It makes a lot of sense for the growth to go that direction. I understand it's not in my backyard and it's upsetting the community. I understand that. As it, at the last meeting I said if anybody had concerns, they were welcome to reach out to me. I've had, there's been several meetings. I haven't been asked to attend, to comment, anything else. My, my phone's on. Many of the people know where I live. I'm, I'm accessible. Uh, we've scaled the project down along with the county. I believe three to four different times to get to the current level. Bridge lines were considered. Uh, the, the clustered housing was considered. Water's been considered. We did that last test in August of 2010 to give it a worst case scenario. Uh, we didn't test it in the spring. We tested it after running the wells for after we completed an irrigation to get the wells at a, at a low stage instead of starting them out fresh. So I think we geared that uh, towards a worst case scenario. I've got, uh, I, 
did some very, very simple, because I am simple, uh, illustrations. Um, citrus, citrus needs about two and a half gallons, or two and a half acre feet of water per year. An acre foot of water equals 325,851 and a half gallons. That would um, uh, be equivalent to using 815,000 gallons per acre of citrus per year. We have the potential of growing about 200 acres of citrus there at 815,000 gallons is 163 million gallons of water per year if we get to 200 acres. A house, and I, you can go on Google and look at it, some of the state standards like uh, Sacramento, Googling it this morning, Sacramento had reports of using from 278 to 400 gallons per household. Um, our study at 500 gallons a day per home 500 gallons a day per home times 365 days a year equals 182,500 gallons a year. 182,500 gallons per year times 162 homes equals 29,565,000 gallons. Citrus gallons again is 163 million. 160 homes gallons again is 29,565. The savings, and you know, I don't say this easily as a farmer because we do need to produce food, and to produce food does take water. But in this case, in this locale, that would save 133,435 gallons per year in houses versus in citrus. So I understand it would it would change a lot, but I go back to the county. It's where the county has wanted growth. When we bought the property, it had the zoning on it. We paid something extra for that zoning, not knowing when that day would come. But many farmers, when they're changing their operations, they look at the zoning. I had one, one farmer here that everybody would know, who was a neighbor of mine in a different area, decided to sell out, had 160 acres. They looked at their zoning, AE20. I can tell you it's not 160 acres anymore because it had more value in 20s than it did as a contiguous 160 acres. So it's just kind of the way it works. I, that's, that's it. Thank you. I had more, but I, I think you, I'll Ms. stop Roberts. there. Thank you, Good morning, Chairman Diaz and fellow commissioners. My name is Lori Schwaller. I live at 43857 South Fork Drive in Three Rivers. And I would like to urge you not to recommend approval of this development because it does not promote the public's vision as expressed in the workshops held countywide at the outset of the general plan update process and subsequently expressed throughout the general plan itself and the Foothill Growth Management Plan. This was a vision for a county with clean air, a reliable water supply, growth focused in our existing communities, preservation of our agricultural and open space lands, and a more diverse economy. This proposed development of isolated rural residential sprawl would be completely auto-dependent with no current infrastructure, goods, or services available contributing to worse air quality in a county which often suffers from the worst air quality in the nation. It would pave over currently productive agricultural and open space lands, use much more water than a responsible, efficient development, and do nothing to diversify our economy or promote the development and prosperity of our existing communities. Additionally, it would destroy a scenic viewshed and landscape along with the cherished rural agricultural character of the neighborhood. Neighboring property owners are strongly opposed to this highly inappropriate proposed development. Furthermore, letters from the State Department of Conservation and the State Department of Fish and Wildlife indicate numerous potential adverse impacts to local habitat and wildlife from the proposed development. 
By recommending approval of this development, the county would appear to be planning for the short-term enrichment of a single developer at the expense of the health, safety, welfare, values, and vision of its citizens. It would appear to be giving not even lip service to the tenets of responsible, sustainable, healthy growth and development, and the tenets of AB 32 and SB 375. And it would ignore the values, concepts, guiding principles, and many of the goals and policies of the county's 2030 general plan update as detailed in the letter that we have given to you in your packets today. For all these reasons, and many more that you've heard expressed this morning, we urge you to not recommend approval of this proposed development. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Swan. Good morning. My name is Rob Roberts, and I guess I'm glad that these folks don't all have a noose with the trees outside. A um, couple of things. The, the woman that preceded me addressed economic development. Uh, I don't think it can be understated that Woodlake in particular is a somewhat disadvantaged community. While this property is not within the city limits nor necessarily within the sphere of influence of the city of Woodlake, it is, the residents of this development will without a doubt spend a lot of money in the city of Woodlake. Whether it's at the grocery store or the hardware store or the restaurants or the feed store or whatever else is there. And Woodlake would benefit from additional economic activity. Woodlake would benefit, also benefit from additional employment. During the construction phases, I think it would be fair to say that at least some portion of the workforce would come from Woodlake. Uh, on an ongoing basis, at least some portion of the people that would service this community, whether they be plumbers or electricians or yard service people or household help or whatever, would come from the city of Woodlake, generating additional economic opportunity. You know, probably the closest parallel that to be looked at is Badger Hill. You know, in our vision of the world, this, this development would be something akin to Badger Hill. <laughs> Badger Hill has... Badger Hill has 133 lots plus four or five large common areas. Has... Can anybody say that Badger Hill has been detrimental to Exeter? I don't think so. You know, I, I had a flyer that came into my possession that said uh, that our development was going to lower the house values in the area. Did Badger Hill lower the house values, values in Exeter? I don't think so. So, you know, a lot of this just strikes me as not in my backyard. And I'll answer any questions anybody may have. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Do we have anybody else? Okay, seeing none, then I will close the public testimony portion and move back to uh, the staff. And, uh, oh, oh, we had one? One left. One left, okay, is this the last? All right. I'll reopen, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have something new to add. That's good, <clears throat> and your name and address, sir? Uh, Don Manro. Uh, from uh, the city of Tulare. Um, yeah, one, one uh, critical reason why this project shouldn't be recommended or approved is that it works 
directly against the guiding principles of the county's general plan. And I was one of the, the uh, community members that helped work on, on the, uh, uh, the goals and, and priorities during the uh, public workshops way back when. <clears throat> Uh, principle one that it goes against is provide opportunities for small unincorporated communities to grow or improve quality of life and their economic viability. If we need 162 new houses, why aren't locating them within one of our nearby unincorporated communities like Woodlake? Um, help them grow. Who benefits economically and whose quality of life improves if the development is allowed as proposed? Not our un unincorporated communities. Principle two, reinvestment, which is promote reinvestment in existing unincorporated communities in a way that enhances the quality of life and their economic viability in these locations. Principle three, production of resources. Protect the county's important agricultural resources and scenic natural lands from urban encroachment through the implementation of goals and policies of the general plan. The proposed development directly contradicts this principle. And finally, principle four, limit rural residential development. Quote, strictly limit natural residential development potential in important agricultural areas outside of incorporated communities, hamlets, cities, uh, urban area boundaries, urban development boundaries. Uh, that is, avoid rural residential sprawl. Is the general plan just a piece of paper or does the county actually intend to make planning decisions based on its value statements, concepts, principles, and goals and policy? This is it in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Okay. There's no one else, and I'm closing the public testimony portion. Moving back to staff and... Um, Good. Mr. Spada, would you like to yes, say Mr. something? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Przybilski, will you read the recommendation and the alternatives? Uh, yes. Staff's recommendation, uh, original recommendation was adopt the mitigated negative declaration and mitigation monitoring reporting plan and approve the tenant map uh, in number 812. This is a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, staff has uh, three other uh, recommended alternatives. Uh, one, uh, number three, is uh, supervisors adopt the mitigated egg deck and monitoring plan and approve tentative uh, track 812 subject to modifications and additions or deletions of the finding as discussed. Uh, number four, thank your that your commission deny the, uh, recommend denial of the proposal and direct staff to prepare findings for said denial based on discussion of the grounds by the planning commission. And number five, refer the project back to staff uh, for further study and report. Thank you. Mr. Potter, we had um, quite a bit more testimony here today, but uh, we responded to pretty much everything there. Uh, I didn't hear anything significantly new. As, um, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, it, it's in your discretion in terms of whether you would like further response or whether you feel enough information has been supplied in the record in order to make a decision vis-a-vis -vis the recommendation or the alternatives. Okay. Now I'm going to move it on to the back up to the commission here, and uh, I want to take uh, see what their thoughts are uh, as about the information they got and what what, what they might want to do. Mr. Norman, would you? Uh, I get to go first. You know, why don't you give me your opinion? Okay, good deal. Um, Growing up in this area, uh, my dad taught at Woodlake High School for 35 years. This is a, a, a great area. Um, I remember, as, uh, and I'll try and be brief, but I remember coming up to the house when I was young, and I had a, uh, a snake in my hand. Um, I 
put my um, finger behind the snake's head and I said, um, Dad, I'm doing just like Marlon Perkins said. I get this snake out here. He goes, yeah, I think it's a king snake. He goes, that's not a king snake. Put it down. <laughs> so that was my first discovery of rattlesnakes in Woodlake. Not a good time when you're under five. Um, Pro-economic development. This is great for the Woodlake community on the outlying areas. Um, after that, for me, it gets very thin. Um, I'm concerned about the wastewater treatment aspect of it, um, whether it be done by a community service district, something that is fine. Um, I know the Badger Hill uh, comparison was brought up. Um, some of the problems up there they have with um, their uh, wastewater treatment and disposal. Um, adjoining communities, uh, fit in the community, adjoining communities versus urban sprawl. This for me is more of an urban sprawl issue. And it, it for me, it just does not fit in the, uh, the um, area. Uh, things running downhill, um, you've got some areas up there, uh, again, back to wastewater treatment, storm treatment issues, I, I think there's some definite concerns. Um, the aesthetics, and, and it is a beautiful area, and um, getting out there, and uh, absolutely, I would not want it in my backyard, um, but with the uh, snakes and the issues, I guess that's why I live in the city. So, But um, anyway, um, those are my comments. Hey, Mr. Chair. Mr. Elliott? Um, I, I still echo um, some of the thoughts I had at the last meeting. Um, I do want to say that I know in the 1970s, Disney was looking at putting a fog-free airport in that area with some luxury homes on the ridge tops. Maybe that would have been better or more appropriate. I don't know. But I can tell you that what is proposed here I just can't feel is appropriate for this area and today. And I think a couple of points that came up really underscored that situation. Number one, the uh, Foothill Management Growth Plan in 1981, it's not working in 2014, a lot of the things. And this is one of the things. In those days, yeah, this seemed like a, a, a kind of development maybe that was appropriate then. We come back now with a general plan that encourages development in outlying areas in rural development boundaries. I don't see that as a part of this project. I also asked the applicant if they'd be willing to, you know, propose something else. They're comfortable with this. I am not comfortable with this. And so I would, uh, I would not be able to support this in this present kind of situation. Neil, any comments? I, um, I think this is a tough uh, situation where, yeah, uh, if it were in my backyard, I would hate it. Um, there's been um, communities that pop up everywhere. At, at some point, it has to happen. Um, I'm sure we agree that it will happen at some point throughout the county. I think the timing for this is uh, still not right um, and much too large of a scale of, a, of development and I would not feel comfortable with that. No? I appreciate the fact that this is a planned zone area but however I, I, I honestly believe that we need to infill more of our community. And as far as the economic development, if you're infilling Willick, you're going to get that economic, you're going to get the same economic development. Maybe not as big, but there are some benefits to that. So, uh, and then, then we have the preset in the county of trying to preserve farmland. And this, is, this, this project is too big, too early, and uh, I'd rather see more infill of our regular community and have them develop. Nancy? Um. Pretty much what every one of the other commissioners have said is what I feel. Uh, I do feel that this is probably an example, and I am not a licensed planner, so you know, take it for what it's worth. Um, I do feel like it's urban sprawl, and, and I think it's very premature, and yes, there will be a time when there will be things developed up there, maybe much on a much smaller scale. But there will be times when that is what's going to happen. That's our general plan. But I do feel like it's very premature right now. Thank you. 
Uh, well, from my point of view, first of all, the mitigated negative deck isn't the docu document. It's not adequate. If it's going to go forward, it's going to need an EIR. Uh, but, you know, I, I kind of have to agree with John. I've been thinking about this for a couple of weeks now since the last meeting on the deal here. And we're, we're applying 1990 or probably 1970 standards to 2020 conditions. And uh, we just we have to face the fact that we're going to be limited with water is going to be a limiting factor. Uh, water quality, is, uh, and I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to say that there can't be an engineered system that would work, that might work out there, but for 60 years or more that I'm aware of, uh, the water quality is degraded in this, in this uh, valley. Um, I don't know if it's from septic tanks or if it's from over-fertilization or if it's from uh, municipal treatment plants putting water on, on large areas or if it's naturally occurring and God put it there. But the nitrates uh, continue to go up. And uh, so I'm not convinced and I'm not comfortable with the design of this uh, deal without, without a, a community water treatment. Uh, I would like to see it pared down. It's a lot of, a lot of units. I'd like to see more green area in the thing. I'd like to see that uh, water, that treated water used for the, for the uh, open areas and some of the green spaces if it were to go forward. Um, I, I think we need to look at designing this thing for the 2020s and 2030s. We have to have this set up to that it's going to uh, uh, be able to fit in easily with, with, uh, with solar power and anything along those lines. So the, way, the way it's designed right now is just, it's just old stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't support that, that position there. So my question, I guess, to the rest of the commission, have, have you guys heard enough testimony that you're willing to move forward with a, a motion and, or, or uh, a recommendation to the, to the staff? I am. And I'm, I'll choose number four and make a motion to deny. I would second that. Okay. We have a motion then uh, to that the commission deny the proposal and direct staff to prepare findings for said denial based on uh, discussion of grounds for denial by the Planning Commission. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Tong? Yes. Elliot? Yes. Diaz? Yes. Whitlatch? I'm sorry. Eliano? Yes. Norman? Yes. Ayala? Yes. Okay. So uh, when uh, we will be back with uh, with the, uh, the findings for uh, a denial on this. Uh, at that point in time, the applicant can uh, go uh, go to to I guess take it to the board of supervisors, right? Appeal. Uh, appeal. What I would yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. What I would suggest mm -hmm. is probably at the next planning commission, we'll present the uh, resolution for recommending denial, pursuant to the expressions of your commissioners, and then the matter would move on to the board of supervisors. Okay. 